We are going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse, chapter by chapter, which is our style of teaching through the Word of God. And tonight our message is in chapter 11. If you have a Bible, you want to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 for our message, Genuine Care. Paul the Apostle cares so much for these people, the Corinthians, and yet they had such a tumultuous relationship. Sometimes, uh, if you've raised kids, you know that once you get a teenager in the household, there's tension, unless they're uh, a, a, an, the very compliant child that basically raises themselves. You know any of those? People that have compliant children, or usually one of them, because God fixes that with the younger ones, um, you know, people with compliant kids think they're ready to write a book and hold a seminar. And uh, then you throw a couple of strong-willed kids at them, and uh, they're just as desperate as the rest of us. But there's tension, because you really, really care, but you have to be involved in their business. And, and pastoring is very much like uh, a father in, in parenting. And Paul the Apostle is speaking in such a way to the Corinthians. And he's going to have to be very strong in some areas. He's going to have to communicate his heart of care because he is being strong. And let's read the first four verses to get us started as we look at our message, Genuine Care. What's it look like? What's it sound like to minister and love people you really care about? It says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. First thing you have to understand as we jump right into this text is that if you're going to genuinely care about people, sometimes in the dialogue, like he's writing a letter, and when you write, you have to communicate differently than when you're speaking face-to-face -face because when you're speaking face-to-face, -face, they can see the subtle nuances of your face and the body language and all those different things are communicating certain truths to people. But when you write, you have to be extra careful about how uh, you're communicating. And so as he writes this, he says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. The first thing you have to understand if you're going to care about people and speak the truth and love when your relationship's in tension is it's going to be a little awkward, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, we're not going to have a show of hands, but how many of you enjoy being in tense relationship? How many of you enjoy going through awkward, difficult uh, conversations and relationally working through things? I don't know very many people that are normal people. There are other people that are just contentious type of people. They love arguments. They love fights. They just, they don't know what to do if they don't have a good tangle every, every week. And I've known a few of those people. But the majority of us, we're uncomfortable with that because we just want peace, right? You just want peace. Especially the older you get, give me peace. I had enough drama in the early years. I want peace. But you have to realize that, first of all, you're going to have to be okay with awkwardness. Anytime I confront somebody, anytime I work through hard things, which I have to as a pastor all the time, it's a regular part of my job description, it's awkward. And I finally just had to get to that place that, you know what, I'm all right with awkward. I'm not sure how to start this conversation, so I'm just going to, boom, jump in with both feet. And I just, I just go for it. And afterwards, I'm always thankful that I, I by God's grace, stepped across the line of the awkward into the reality of communication, sharing the truth and love. Secondly, if you're going to have awkward moments of confrontation with people, individuals, groups, whatever it might be, you need to be clear to express the care and concern of your heart. Uh, because if I'm going to talk to you about hard things, you need to know I care. Because otherwise we're not going to get anywhere because you'll just throw up your defenses. But it's really a genuine love and care. And so when you try to approach somebody without love and care and even expressing how you feel about the situation, 
you're probably not going to be very fruitful. You're not going to be very productive. That's why a lot of people that are really combative or confrontational, they wonder how come it never works out for them. Well, because they never communicate care. They never communicate love and concern, correct? And so he says in verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is power-packed with a picture, not only of a godly jealousy, but of a father's heart. You see, in their day of prearranged marriage, you would betroth your daughter to a bridegroom. And now the betrothal was so strong that you actually, it was a one-year agreement. We would call it an engagement. But this engagement was so strong in their culture, you actually had to get a divorce from being engaged. That's how strong it is, okay? So it's one year, you're not together, but it's a betrothal. And here with a father's heart, he said, I betrothed you to one husband, and I wanted to see you get to the wedding day as a chaste virgin. Now, any father that is worth his salt and has a godly understanding of scripture, that's your heart's desire. I had a precious daughter, beautiful daughter. She's just drop dead gorgeous, like model kind of looks. Now that's a problem, right? It's a problem, why? Because obviously guys are attracted to her, but not all the right guys are attracted to her. And there, there was a season in time where it's like bugs to a light. Man, and I had to get out the fly swatter. <laughs> I'm like, and we had to have some very strong conversations. As a loving father, I was in her business because I wanted to ultimately, this was my dream one day, because I know that it is God, the will of God, our sanctification as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which has to do with sexual purity. At one, I mean, in the future, I wanted to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle and put her hand in the hand of another man and say, here is my beautiful love of my life. She's my girl. Nobody's good enough for her, but okay, she fell in love with you type of thing, Right? And, and I'm going to have to give her away to somebody. And as I want to give her away, I want to say, here is my chaste virgin daughter. Now, in biblical times, Old Testament, New Testament, in these times, that's God's heart. In our culture, not very many people make it to the altar, the wedding altar, with sexual purity, right? Right? People are sexually promiscuous from junior high, high school, right on, run on through it. It doesn't happen very often. But the joy of my heart on that wedding day to be able to do that was just a thrill. But it was quite a job. Being involved, even the, the son that came along, we were praying for a Christian. He showed up. I said, what's your name? He said, Christian. Oh, great. We were praying for that. His name's Christian. And uh, they fell in love. It was a whirlwind romance. And he, you know, had grown up in the, in the Lord and this and that. And uh, they wanted to get married. They didn't want a big, long, drawn-out thing so that they could get married and not be in immorality. They said, hey, we know this is the deal. Let's just get married. It was, I mean, literally like, I can't remember. It was weeks. But we had been praying about it. We knew that this was the Lord's will. And so even if we're gonna, they're going to get, this is their dream, to get married at sunset on the beach in Florida. It was like this, it was like a movie scene when they got married. And it was only a handful of us there. And they're on the beach and the sun's going down and there's a sailboat on the horizon. I mean, you couldn't orchestrate it. It was so incredible. And here I'm able to not only give my daughter away, but then I stood in front and, and did the wedding. But the night before, this Christian boy, my son-in-law, I love him like a son now. He's a great kid. And, and he wanted to honor Jess. He wants to honor the Lord. But the night before the wedding, we were there at a hotel room where we were. And my daughter was on a hide-a-bed, and we were there. And, and, my son, and they were just laying there, and we had been up late talking. And they fell asleep. And I was waiting for him to get up and go home, but he fell asleep. So tomorrow they're getting married. But that's Tomorrow. So I came out, and it's like 11.30 at night. I said, Christian, 
what, what, I'm sorry, I, I fell asleep. I said, go home. <laughs> my daughter's like, dad, he might fall asleep at the wheel. I said, he's a man, tomorrow he, you're all his. Not tonight, get out of here, go home. And so it was kind of a, it was just an awkward moment. And I just jumped right in the middle of it. It was very awkward. I'd send him packing. The next day I loved him like a son-in-law and here's, here's my daughter. But you know, it takes a little uh, diligence to be involved with such things, not just letting go and say, oh, it'll all work out. Yeah, it'll work out. Baby's too soon. Never mind. So the reality that Paul the Apostle now uses this picture of a father saying to the congregation of the Corinthians, he said, I wanted to present you in, to Christ as this virgin bride. And I am jealous. Notice he says this. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. What's that mean? Usually you and I only use jealousy in the context of negativity. They're a jealous jerk. What do we mean by that? We mean that they jealously want to keep what is theirs, sometimes even in a delusional way. There are people that are just crazy jealous. And they, they really have issues. They have issues in their mind. They have issues with life. They have issues with their own security. And so they're wanting to keep selfishly what is theirs. But godly jealousy wants to keep everything in the right proportion of who's who. And so this father wanted to, Paul the Apostle's picture, is to have a godly jealousy so his daughter was a virgin so that he could present her to Christ. So the picture of the church being this daughter and ultimately doing that. So the reality of getting in people's business, there is a place for godly jealousy. The Bible says the Lord is jealous in a godly way, meaning that he doesn't want any rivals for your love. He doesn't want anybody else stealing the love that he wants to have with you, the love relationship. In a godly jealousy, I'm jealous for my wife's love. I'm never worried about Tammy's faithfulness, whether she's being faithful to me or unfaithful. I always know just with absolute confidence who she is, that she's faithful. If we're apart, I'm not worried about what she's doing because she's faithful. But this is the reality, is that um, if I think about some guy like intruding to our relationship, that makes me kind of bristle up. And if some girl starts getting too close to me, my wife bristles up. And it's really fun to watch her bristle up. You don't want any of that action, I promise you. You don't want nothing to do with that action right there. And, and the thing is, there's a godliness that wants, right? I want my wife's affection. She wants my, I don't want her, like, it would be such a bummer if Tammy came home and said, you know, Rick, you're great. I've loved you all these years, these 30 years. And I'm, I'm just still going to stick with you five days a week. But, you know, Saturday, Sunday, you know, they're George's and I'm bringing George home. How do you think that's going to go? That's not going to go well. Right? George is dying and I'm going to prison and going to have a prison ministry. <laughs> that's what's happening. Right? Why? Because there's a godly desire to guard affection. So Paul the Apostle here, he lays this out, and then he says, who is trying to seduce? Who's the other man in the bride's life? Who's the one that's trying to slip in? Well, it's Satan. See, you not only realize you have to be a little awkward to really genuinely care about people, but you also have to express your loving care. But Thirdly, you really need to understand that we live and are experiencing a spiritual warfare where Satan is active, as it says in verse 3, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity as that is in Christ, singleness of uh, the, the whole desire that he has here is that Satan not deceive or seduce the bride of Christ. And that's what's been going on at Corinth. These false teachers are going to come in, and he's, he's going to call them out here in a moment in the passage of Scripture. But they're seducing the bride away from, they used to have just a simple relationship with Jesus. They just loved Jesus. Jesus was awesome. God's word was awesome. Coming to the house of the Lord and worshiping the Lord and loving one another and praying together and, and hearing and growing in the word of God. It was so simple. Remember the early days of your Christian life, the simplicity of it, and I pray that you never lose that simplicity. I am absolutely 100% convinced in the profound power of simplicity in Christ. 
But what happens when people begin to complicate their spiritual life? Just like Adam and Eve, they had the simplest life. Think about it. They're in the Garden of Eden. The Lord said, hey, you guys, you two are going to be one flesh. You're going to take care of this garden. I mean, they, they had no clothes. They had no laundry. They had no kids. I mean, it couldn't be any simpler, really. And the serpent comes along and says, hey, can you eat of any tree? She says, well, there's one tree we can't. We have all of these fruit trees, hundreds of them but we can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan complicates it with his seduction. And that's a picture he uses here. Just as Satan's seduced Eve, Satan is trying to seduce you. And some of us here tonight, Satan is trying, seeking, coming after you to seduce you. And how's he doing it? In our picture, he, it was a sexual seduction, the illustration, if you will, but now he brings that into the spiritual understanding that Satan is trying to spiritually seduce the bride of Christ into sin. And he does this by complicating things. This is, it's crazy, isn't it? I'll talk to somebody that's struggling with an issue in their life. And, and, and as they're struggling, and in their struggling emotionally, they say it's just too complicated. I'll say it's not complicated. The Bible just says this. It's as simple as A, B, C. You got that, A, B, C. It's simple. No, it's more complicated. It's complex. It's this and that. No, you're all twisted up in your own mind. God keeps things simple for you and I. He keeps them, he keeps them simple. You remember this statement? Kiss. Keep it simple. Stupid. But if it's your wife, it's keep it simple, sweetheart. Right? Roxanne taught me that. Don't ever say kiss to Tammy. And yet the reality is, is that ultimately religious leaders and spiritual movements that begin to come into churches, this is the way it works in our church. The Lord's doing a cool thing, been doing a cool thing for years, 23 years. And people that are like these false teachers, they can't go out and start their own thing. It, it won't work because they're just involved with dead religion. But they'll start trickling in by infiltration into the church. And this is the most dangerous thing for us as a church. Persecution is not our danger because we're just going to huddle up and love Jesus more. But infiltration and seduction is more subtle. And so they begin to come in and, and they see this work and they're kind of excited about the work for one simple reason. They're going to begin to draw disciples away. And people have been growing in their simple love relationship with Jesus. This is simply what the Bible says. This is how the Spirit's leading. This is how you simply pray. This is how you simply worship. It's a profoundly simple, powerful Christian life. But they come along and go, hey, you know, I know you guys are, you know, it's, it's, it's okay what's being taught there. But ultimately, we have a Bible study at our home, and we teach the deep things of God, the secret things of God. And pretty soon, some people will drift along and I'll say, hey, where do those people go? And then I'll see them, and they'll tell me about how they got seduced away by somebody that began to teach, oh, they have the secret insight. They have, they have more information. And what happens is simplicity goes out the door. Complexity comes in with their legalistic systems, and all the joy goes away. And, and they become a dead religious group of people, but they think they're so smart. They think they're so smart. You see, the seduction takes place, and uh, as it says here in verse 4, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may put up with it. They're putting up with all this garbage, and notice these three things. This is an incredibly important strategic passage of Scripture for you to know as a Christian. You should underline this. You should have this marked in your Bible, verses 3 and 4, because there are all these religious movements that they use the name of Jesus. They actually use the Bible. They say they believe the gospel, and they say that you can experience the Spirit, but they all mean different terminologies. We live in the heart and soul of one of those number one false religions in the world, the LDS Church, the Mormon Church. And they come along and say, hey, we believe in Jesus. And you say, really? You believe in Jesus? And they say, yeah. We believe in the King James Bible. 
Really? And we have all these other books. We have more information. You Christians are kind of like kindergarten kids, but we have secret understanding. We have secret rites in a temple, and you can go behind closed doors, and you must have a temple recommend. Only secret people go in there, and you can wear your garments, and you can go through this whole procedure, and nobody can talk, Shh. Nobody can talk about what happens in here because it's secret. And is there anything more seductive than secrets? I want to be a part of it. Is there secrets? I want to know what the secrets are all about, right? I want to know what the secrets are all about. And so you get seduced into it. And they say, we believe in Jesus, and immediately go, oh, good, well, I believe in Jesus. And you immediately think it's the same person. But you begin to hear the definition of their Jesus. Their Jesus is Lucifer's brother. So, oh, that's not my Jesus from the Bible. He's the creator of all angels and fallen angels. He's the creator of all things. What do you mean, Jesus and Lucifer? Oh, yeah, they're, they're brothers. And they both give their bid to the heavenly Father to see who was going to go after planet Earth. And who won? Jesus. He won. And this whole process that begins to unfold. And you go, wait, I, I think your Jesus is different. It would be like somebody telling you, hey, I know Rick Brown. You know Rick Brown? You go, yeah, I know Rick Brown. And so immediately, you just take it at face value, you know the same guy. Do you know that Rick Brown's a very common name? There's all kinds of Rick Browns, <laughs> even in our community. So if you're talking about Rick Brown that's 5'6 and has ginger red hair and freckles, you're talking about a different Rick Brown than me. But we have the same name. You see, the Jehovah Witnesses show up on your door, knock on your door. Hi, we're with the Watchtower Society. We have some magazines for you. And they'll say they believe in Jesus, but you see, the Jehovah Witnesses actually believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. That's who they believe he is. And so if the Mormons believe Jesus and Lucifer and brothers, and that's not what the Bible teaches, and the Jehovah Witnesses think it's Michael the Archangel and that he's actually not God in human flesh, and they came up with their own New World translation of the Bible to... Uh, I was just thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to be able to put this on our TV program. Because I'm totally going for the jugular right now, okay? So I want you to know that we are an equal opportunity offender, but you have to come to church to experience it. Okay, let's continue on. I just had to get out that off my chest. So the reality is, is that, is that Jehovah Witnesses, they have their version of Jesus, Right? Now, the gospel of the Mormons, when the Mormons say, I, we believe the gospel, you go, oh, good, we believe the gospel. And what we believe as New Testament Christians for 2,000 years, this is the gospel recorded by Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter, three, uh, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. He says, now, this is the, that which I received from the Lord, I delivered to you, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. What is the gospel? Jesus died upon the cross for your sins, was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. That's the gospel. Finished story. The Son of God finished the story. But when you talk to a Mormon, the entire teaching of the Mormon church is the gospel. The entire teaching of it. And so their doctrine and covenants, the Book of Mormon, the uh, Word of Wisdom, all of the stuff is the gospel. So you have to embrace, you know, this full, you have to eat the whole enchilada, so to speak. Now, the gospel is the doorway to have a relationship with God. But you receive it by faith, right? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's what Romans 6, or 10, 9 says, correct? But for the Mormons... And the Jehovah Witnesses, and can I share with you, every other religion in the world with the exception of biblical Christianity believes that you approach God by your own works. Every single religion believes you approach God by your good works. Only Christianity says, Jesus finished the work on the cross and said, now just believe and enter into my finished work. 
we get to experience the grace of God, which is a gift of unmerited kindness and favor from a loving God. I've never worked for salvation. I can never earn salvation. I'll never deserve salvation. All I can do is receive salvation. And because I receive salvation, then my life is transformed. And what, pray tell, what happens? I want to do good works. See, they put the cart before the horse. Can you imagine waking up every day and wondering if you were good enough today for God to love you and for you to deserve his favor? Because that's what good works. There's only two approaches to God. You gotta get this into your head. Even you born-again Christians, you can fall into this rut. You're either approaching God by earning and deserving his favor, which you can never do, or by believing and receiving his favor, which is a simple thing to do. Right? So I believe and I receive. I don't earn and deserve. But because of that, I'm so transformed by God's grace that I love serving God. I love doing, I never, even, I never call it good works. You know, I'm about my good works today. You know why I'm here on this Wednesday night, you guys? I'm here for my good works. I'm going to get my brownie badge. I'm going to get my Eagle Scout. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to, you know, God's really happy with me tonight because I studied God's Word all day, and I prayed all day, and I'm here to serve you poor, humble folk. <laughs> right? Can I just share with you a little secret that we try not to let out? Do you know that I get to serve God in spite of me and not because of me. <laughs> I don't deserve to get to do what I do. I don't. No way. But Jesus' grace has saved me and changed me. So I want, I love to do good works. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It tells us, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. For we are his uh, workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has prepared beforehand to walk in them. Do you know that before the foundations of the world, God created me to do what I'm doing right now? He just did. And by his grace, he saved me. And I can't boast or brag about it. I just say glory to be to God that I get to be useful. Now these false teachers come along. These Mormons. These Jehovah Witnesses. They're at your door. And they want to lead you into their secret truth. And that is, you know what? You just can't believe in Jesus and be saved. You've got to do these good works. And they are, they are more than eager, eager to supply a list that you should be doing rather than simply believing and receiving. Well, I don't believe that there was any Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses knocking on doors in Corinth but there were false teachers, there's nothing new under the sun, and they came pretty much with the same package with a different name into their congregation to seduce people, to get them into their legalism. And do you, want, do you understand that it is a different Jesus and it is a different gospel? It's not the same. And it's a different spirit. Well, you know, I read the Book of Mormon and I prayed about it. And I just had whisperings of the spirit. I had burning in my bosom that it was from God. And say, so, well, you can have whisperings of the Spirit, you can have burning in the bosom, but if it's not true, it's just not true. Right? You can have all, you can, oh, it just gives me goosebumps. Emotions and feelings are not evidence of the work of the Spirit. Do you realize Satan loves to present a false Jesus, a false gospel, and the false effect of a spiritual experience S to seduce your soul into their legalism, into their trap, and to take your soul to hell. That's Satan's goal. And he's going to do it through false teachers. And so if you're going to genuinely care about people, you have to say things like this. Every time I do this, I get emails. Every time I do this, people leave the church. Every time I do this, I get told off going out the door about you. I say, you know what? I love you. I genuinely care about you. And I care enough about you to tell you the truth. And if I didn't, I'd just say, you know, I don't care if you get deceived. So what? Uh, you know, go join their deal. Go do it. Whatever. I don't care. 
No, but I do care. And any pastor worth their salt is going to care for his people and not want him to see them seduced into the lies of Satan himself. Now it tells us that verse 5 that we don't need to be intimidated. And Paul the Apostle says in verse 5, I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Paul the Apostle said the people that were swaggering about, this, most commentators do not believe that Paul is speaking about Peter, James, John, those apostles. But the apostles that, these false teachers that were coming in, and they were saying, oh, excuse me, I'm an apostle. I'm a person of authority. And he said, you know what, I don't know what his eminence is saying, but I want you to know that I am not <laughs> inferior to any of uh, the uh, eminent apostles that are coming into the congregation. You see, the thing is, is that when you begin to serve God, there are those who want to seduce, that they have the secret, they have the secret knowledge they want to bring you into. They're puffed up with an air of authority, and they say, I have authority. I hold the Aaronic priesthood. I hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, both of those are impossible to hold, just so you know, biblically speaking. You cannot hold the Aaronic priesthood unless you're a descendant with blood in your veins of Aaron and there is a temple in effect where you can operate as a priest. It's impossible. Secondly, you cannot hold the Melchizedek priesthood because the whole point of the Melchizedek priesthood is it's Jesus. And only Jesus can have the Melchizedek priesthood. So when somebody says, I got authority, I got the Aaronic priesthood, I got the Melchizedek priesthood, I'm here. To save the day. Once again, second time I've repeated myself. <laughs> now, in understanding this, you see the desire is to, oh, I want that priesthood. Oh, I, what do I have to do? What, what hoops do I have to jump through to get all of the, the, the merit badges it takes to be God's servant? And he tells us here, that he is not inferior to any of them. The first thing you get as a Christian pastor in a Mormon community is, where do you get your authority? We have authority down the street. You don't have any authority. Where's your authority? Well, Jesus gave us authority at the Great Commission. He gave it to all Christians, all Christians. He said, all authority, Jesus said this, all authority has been in heaven and earth has been given to me, and now I'm sending you in my name. You go get the job done. And every single one of you, as a believer in Jesus, you have the authority you need to do to get the job done. You don't need the Melchizedek priesthood. You don't need the uh, Aaronic priesthood. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that you and I are a kingdom of priests. That we're all priests. Once I know Jesus, I can intercede on behalf of people to God, and I can be a messenger from God to people. That's all a priest does. He's just, he's just bringing the message. Every single one of us in this room. Not me, up here, every believer in Jesus. This is uh, just called the, you know, the, in Christendom, it is the universal truth that every single born again Christian is a priest of God. And if you're a girl, a priestess, I guess, of God. Every single one of us. And so we don't need to be cowed by people's authority. We don't need to be hunkered into a corner because we're outnumbered. And Paul the Apostle, once again, if you're going to genuinely care, you've got to be bold about these things. In verse 6, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. He says three things here. You see, that one of the charges that these false teachers were giving, in the Greek culture, they really, really admired and prized and elevated eloquence. And Paul was not trained in their Greek schools of communication. And Paul the Apostle says here, though I am untrained in speech. This doesn't mean that Paul can't preach, that he can't speak. But Paul is simply declaring, I am just direct. I bring the message. It doesn't have to be flowery. It doesn't have to be slick. It doesn't have to be fancy. I just tell it like it is, and the Spirit of God uses it. And secondly, he says, but I'm not trained in, I mean, but I'm not untrained in knowledge. Paul the Apostle is one of the most brilliant theological, spiritual minds in all of human history. Mind-blowing. In the book of Romans, uh, I mean, all of his writings are just mind-blowing. 
And so Paul the Apostle says, these false teachers, they're making fun of my preaching. But the communication I'm giving you is filled with the knowledge of God. And it's not only filled with the knowledge of God. He says thirdly in this verse, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Paul lived among these Corinthians for a year and a half. They saw him morning. They saw him noon. They saw him at night. They saw this man walk with God. And let me tell you, that is the most powerful witness. Here's a messenger. And you can hear a message at a service, and yet, but when you see them and you're around them and you live with them, so to speak, as he did for a couple of years there in Corinth, when you see the real deal up close for an extended period of time, and then you say, you know what? The way he lives and the way he talks, they match. He walks the talk. Do you know that the most powerful message your family will ever hear is to see your lifestyle speak loudly, that what you say you believe and how you live your life are consistent with each other. Many people, and this can be a, 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 just the trap of our own self-deception, we are actually living as hypocrites. We say we believe the Bible, but there's glaring areas in our life of flat-out, in-your-face disobedience to God. And the family knows it. Others know it. Your coworkers know it. Your friends know it. Others know it. They go, yeah, this guy goes to church, says he believes the Bible, but... They can just list off X, Y, and Z, how you're living in sin. And, and he's living in sexual sin. He's living in drunkenness. Or he's doing this and that. And he says he's a Christian. If he's a Christian, I'm a Christian. You see, there's no difference. There's no difference, though you have the label of Christianity. It's so important that who you are, who you are, and you're telling other people about Jesus, but you're not taking care of your own business in your life. You're not taking care of business with you and Jesus. It, 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 you know, if you're, you're a Christian and you're having sex with your girlfriend, if you really loved her, you'd say, Jesus doesn't want this. We're either going to get married or we're going to split up, but we're not going to continue in this, this melees of, of sin and, and, and shame God and shame everybody that knows and here we are saying we represent Jesus. We just said we're all priests. So, so the priest is shacked up. The priest is that happy. How are the priests? What's going on? And so Paul, when he tells them that we are thoroughly manifested, the implication seems to be these people are at a distance. They're not letting you see their life. They're not letting you see your life. They're not letting you guys see their life. I let you see my life. It's a difficult thing to kind of wrap your head around the Christian life unless you hear its teaching and see it modeled. You need to hear the teaching and you need to see it modeled. You need to hear the teaching and you need to see it modeled. You need to hear the teaching and see it modeled. My son and daughter have uh, never been, I mean, this should go without saying, my son and daughter have never been impressed with my preaching. Why? Because to them, I have never been their pastor. Who am I? I'm their father. But my son would tell me, Dad, you don't know how bad I just wanted to go off the rails, off into sin. But he said, the thing, the keeping power of Jesus was is in this simple truth. Is seeing you and mom love Jesus as much on, su on Monday morning as you did on Sunday morning, I couldn't escape the reality of it. You see, when your life and what you're saying line up together, it is powerful. And that's what Paul is telling these people. He says in verse 7 through 12, check this out. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. And what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. 
As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. These verses from 7 to 12 say this simple truth. The Corinthians somehow were put out by Paul, and we can only guess at this. They were put out because Paul would not receive financial support. You see, in their Greek world, if a Greek speaker is coming to speak, he's worth his, they would give a honorarium or money to him. And the more popular and valuable you are, right, the more money you would give to him. And if Paul the Apostle is truly an apostle of Christ who saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, then he should, right, if he's, uh, you know, if you get something for free, you get what you pay for kind of attitude, Paul knew that for whatever reason, he could not receive the financial support that normal pastors and ministers would receive from a congregation because these people would turn it around and twist it. So he wanted to remove that obligation. So the whole time he was in Corinth, he says he robbed. It's a hyperbole, meaning that the, the, uh, the churches from Macedonia, they sent me such incredible financial gifts. They supported me and they were congregations, but I never accepted it from you. Not because I don't love you, but because these false teachers that are coming in, they want to be esteemed like me, and I want them to know if they'll minister to you for free, then they're like me, if it's worth it for free. You know, when you start a ministry, when I started the church here 23 years ago, and that first year, you just, you know, in our movement, you don't get any financial support, and you know that when the Lord leads you, it's not about money. It's not about money. Ultimately, you need money to pay the rent, right? You need money for food. You need, you need those things. But I just went to work full-time for the first year. And it's funny. Nobody ever gave me a hard time about anything. <laughs> Why? Because there's, well, there's, we're just putting the money in the bank, saving it up to see what God was going to do. That's what we were doing. You see, the, the truth is, if you will serve God, as Paul is here, even though to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul the Apostle does the most extensive teaching about giving and receiving from ministers and congregations than any other place in the New Testament. He writes to these Corinthians, but he never personally takes the opportunity that's afforded to him because he wanted to rob these false teachers of the ability to say they were just like Paul. And, and they weren't. He says in verse 13 through 15 as we conclude, remember he was talking very strongly about the false teachers that were seducing, Satan was using them, and he was coming in with a different Jesus, a different gospel, and a different spirit. Look what verse 13 through 15 says. Once again, one of the crucial passages for a Christian. You need to underline this, have it marked in your Bible. For such are false apostles transforming themselves into apostles, or excuse me, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. What does he tell us here? These false prophets and false teachers that are empowered and led and directed in their falsehood and seduction of religion by Satan himself can transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Isn't that something that's surprising to you and I? People that are in these false religions, how good they look, right? When they show up on your door and they got a, they got a nice suit, they got a nice little elder badge, they look neat and tidy. I mean, they're nice. Oh, it's for... For the LDS, let's talk about family. Let's, you know, pro-family is a great thing. Everybody struggles in their family. They want in the door. How do you get in the door? Well, talk to people that don't you want a better family life? Who doesn't want a better family life, right? Who doesn't want a better family life? All, all of us do. And the Jehovah Witnesses show up, and they have a beautiful picture of kind of the Garden of Eden picture. And uh, wouldn't it be great if there was peace on earth? Who doesn't want peace on earth, right? And they seem so good, and they're going to say so much, Do you know, that false teachers, they don't show up at your door, right? 
with a pirate patch. Arg, matey. I'm here to destroy your soul and take you to hell. <laughs> right? Are they going to get anywhere with that? Right, you're not getting anywhere with that. What do you have to do? I have to show up and I have to look super good to you guys, right? Hi. This is a $1,000 smile. They taught me to smile like this. They taught me to hold my hands like, hi. Right? And, and I have to look good. I have to have a form of godliness. I need to look righteous. I, I need to have this appearance because you see if Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Don't think of Satan with some pitchfork in his red suit with a little tail and horns. When he seduces, what is he going to look like? He's going to look like an angel of light. So if I'm going to deceive you, say if I, this is my goal. If my goal is deception, you know the best way to deceive you is to tell you 99 truths and then bring, bring one lie in. Right? I just, I need one lie. But if I tell you truth after truth after truth after truth for 99, right? And then the lie comes. Let's say I have a handful of jelly beans right now. That's 100 jelly beans in here. And I tell you, you're, you're getting ready to take a jelly bean. You love jelly beans. You're getting ready to take a jelly bean. And I say, there's 100 jelly beans there, but one of them will kill you. you know, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> right? I, I, don't, I don't want one of your jelly beans because... I don't want that. You see, deception and seduction and satanic influence must come from someone who looks so good that will tell you 99 truths so they can just bring in the one lie. That's how you're seduced. That's why people that do not know the Bible, people that have come even into a born-again experience with Jesus, but they do not know their Bibles, are sitting ducks for those who seduce. Because you'll say, it looks good, it sounds great, and people are so gullible, are so gullible. And so once again, what can Satan do? It says in verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Ultimately, they're going to face judgment. Ultimately, they're going to face judgment. But they can transform themselves into ministers of righteousness so Satan can look like an angel of light. You really want to know, the first thing I do when people start talking to me about spiritual things, and whether they're on my doorstep or this or that, I want to, first I just start off by asking them, who's Jesus? Is he the son of God? Is he God in human flesh, as it says in the Gospel of John? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses, they have their own Bible. It's called the New World Translation. And they'll say, oh, you see, what the Greek really says is he is a God, small g. I said, that's not what it says. But I understand if you were going to deceive me on a doorstep, you would want a book that looks like my Bible and you'd have your own translation of it and say you have your own Greek scholars that deceive me right out of the gate. I could see that. And you look really good. Some time ago, uh, this is a number of years, it was a Saturday. And when just so that you know, I'm a pastor and I can do it. I did it for years. I can go head to head with Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses on my doorstep. I never saw any fruit, ever. And so I just, I just stopped doing it. I just opened the door, nah, no thanks, and I just have nothing to do with it. And so um, I know some people say that they're, they're, that's their ministry, they're called to it. Hey, God bless you. I'm just saying what I do. I, just, I, don't, even, I don't even answer the door. It's a, I don't need that 45 minutes out of my day because I'm not going to get anywhere. Anyway, one day, it was a Saturday, I was preparing my message for Sunday morning. I got my ball cap on, it's Saturday, got my ball cap on. And they knock on the door, I to, oh. I should have known on Saturday morning at 10.30, right? Here's two Jehovah Witnesses. They have the old one, they have the young one. And I, and I opened the door, and I just, and I did, 
And for whatever reason, I've just felt like the Lord said, just, just go for it. Just, okay. So I got on my do the doorstep and I start talking, but I just act like, you know, I don't know really what's going on. And we start talking and I start talking about who Jesus is. And you see the Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. They don't believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. So you, you want to take them to Luke chapter 24 because even though they wrote their own Bible, they didn't change this for their doctor. This is great. Anyway. <laughs> So you take him to Luke 24 when Jesus stands in the room and he appears to the disciples and he says, hey, they were afraid because they thought Jesus was a ghost after the resurrection, right? And so Jesus says, hey, flesh and bone, right? I'm not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bone. What's it saying? They believe that he only rose spiritually, not physically. And I said, hey, it says right here that Jesus rose flesh and bone. Touch me, see, give me something to eat. So he ate some honeycomb and broiled fish. And what they do, you, see, they take theocracy classes to be able to argue scripture. So you better know what you're, if you're going to get a tangle with the Jehovah Witnesses, you better know what you're doing. Because they'll go, they'll leap off to it. They want to take you on it. No, and every time they want to change the subject to go to another text, da, 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 da. let's answer this. And he had answered, no, da, 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 da. I said, you bothered me on a Saturday morning. You came to my doorstep. This is my dime right now. And I want to know about this passage of scripture. And the, the younger guy, you could tell, he was just getting more and more pressured because I, I was holding their feet to the fire about this passage of scripture. And finally, the, the, the young guy, he raises his head like we're in a classroom. <laughs> and I said, yes? And he goes, I got to go to work. And he just took off from the door. And the old guy was let there stand, and, and he got flustered. He, he couldn't answer it. He, he didn't know what to, what to do with it. And then he finally went, you don't go to that Calvary Chapel place, do you? <laughs> and I said, as a matter of fact, I do. I didn't tell him I was the pastor or anything. He said, you don't go to that Calvary Chapel. And I said, I do go there. But, you know, I was so encouraged, you guys, by this. What does that tell us? He was meeting a bunch of you folks that study your Bibles, knock on his door or her door, and they know what they're faced about, and they're not getting seduced. They're not getting pulled into this thing. Be vigilant, because the enemy wants to get you and I into false religion. We're never going to, I'm never afraid of what's going to attack us outside. It's the infiltration that is the problem. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for this time tonight. Pray that your grace would just meet us in a special way as we close this service. And I know there are some here tonight, Lord, they might be LDS. They might come from a background of Jehovah Witnesses. And Lord, I pray, Lord, <laughs> I've been really bold. I pray that um, there would not be a fence because of me, but I pray that there would be an honest examination of what your word says. And so, Lord, Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.